Encounter is brought to you by the Broome County Council of Churches, where we connect compassion with needs as we inspire growth with dignity. You'll find us in special places throughout the community. For those who remain hungry, we provide meals. For those who are challenged, we build wheelchair ramps. We comfort those who are ill, minister to those who are confined, and we remain an advocate for change and understanding on behalf of every element of our community. Connect and inspire. Encounter the Broome County Council of Churches. Good morning, I'm Jeff Kellum, welcoming you to this week's edition of Encounter. I'm the parish associate at the Union Presbyterian Church in Endicott. We're here at a very busy intersection uh, near 212 North McKinley Avenue, the site of what used to be St. Casimir's Church. It's now Mercy House, and we're going to be talking with the Executive Director, Linda Serra, and the Volunteer Coordinator, Anne LaMonaco. We're going to be talking about a ministry uh, which you think, oh, hospice and a Mercy House, this is going to be a depressing half hour. No, it's not. This is a place of hope and comfort uh, where people have a sense of ministry with those in their final days and weeks, perhaps months. So join us now as we talk uh, to those two folks who are so much a part of the program here at Mercy House and have been as they celebrate their fifth anniversary in our community. Linda Sarah, you're the executive director of Mercy House and you've been here uh, from the beginning? Yes, yes. Started volunteering uh, in 2014 before we even purchased the church in 2015 and renovated and opened in March of 2016. So right. I did a lot of the um, fundraising and marketing behind the scenes for a few years, served on the board of directors, and then in 2017 uh, became the executive director. Right. And your background was in marketing? Uh, business, oh, yes. Okay. okay. Mm -hmm. So making the transition from business, yes. um, which is pretty much, uh, I'm picturing spreadsheets and figures and well, markets and that kind of thing, right. Right. and now in a ministry uh, of, of comfort. Right. What was that transition like? The transition was really an easy one for me. You know, the financial spreadsheets, those never go away, right? When you operate nonprofit or for-profit, that never goes away. Uh, human resources, all that's involved in running an operation. But because of the ministry, it was very important to me uh, because I felt, along with Father Clarence, the founder of Mercy House, that this was needed in the community. And I was raised to always give back. So I felt this is truly where I could do that. Mm -hmm. And I love it. So the transition has been an easy one. Father Clarence. Yes. So tell me a little bit of his story. I know um, he was concerned about one of his own family members. Correct. So he had two family members that were terminally ill, and he's a full-time pastor, as you know. So it was difficult for him working full-time in his ministry to care for his family members. So he actually found Francis House in Syracuse. That's where his family is. And he had his aunt um, go to live at Francis House, and he thought, oh my gosh, this is great. And talking about giving back to your own local community, he felt that we should do something here and to give back. So he was the, the vision uh, behind Mercy House. So he brought that model, which we've made our own, you know, as our own now, um, forward. And of course we did due diligence and found a need. So here we are. Yeah. You've been here for five years, celebrating your fifth anniversary. Fifth anniversary of operations, yeah. Does that count 2020? <laughs> <laughs> Things changed a little bit in the past year. Yes, yes, it sure did. Um, we were blessed to be able to stay open. We did have to pause operations for a few weeks when the pandemic first began, just to figure out, like everybody else, what's going on? Mm -hmm. What do we do? What is this? So we followed all the CDC guidelines, Department of Health, and we were still open. Residents had to be negative for COVID. The staff was tested uh, every other week for COVID. So, you know, thank goodness uh, nobody here, it's been a safe haven. Mm -hmm. So the residents um, are admitted uh, with a negative COVID test. Right. So we're blessed to continue 
the Mission of Mercy House and to be able to help those, whether it was two at a time, four at a time, six at a time, it just varied throughout the past year. Right. And certainly um, during that time of transition, we're opening up now and right. we've, the three of us have been vaccinated, so yes. no masks here, but out in the more public areas, you're still wearing masks. Oh, yes. And we that will continue out. until... That will continue until... Yeah. I don't know when, yeah. <laughs> but we want everyone to be safe, the families, the residents. So we still follow the guidelines. Everybody is goes through the questionnaire when they come in. We do the temperature checks and they have to have a mask on, on the floor and in the resident room. Yeah. Yeah. So we are in a, a, a church. It was yes. converted St. Casimir's. Yes. Um, and uh, the, the sanctuary has been uh, remodeled so that there are individual rooms. There's a kitchen where the altar used to be. Right. Yep. Um, it's a holy atmosphere. I mean, it's, it, this is um, part of a ministry with uh, Lord's Hospice. Is that is correct? Not, not under the hospital necessarily. No, no. So our exclusive partner is Hospice at Lord's. So we are a community care shelter and Hospice at Lord's provides the medications and the care plans for our team to carry out for the residents. Mm -hmm. So think of Mercy House as a large home. We have 10 bedrooms. And just like at home, if you have a, a family member who is terminally ill and hospice comes into the home, that's what they do here. Right. So instead of maybe seeing one or two family members, they see 10. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, LaMonico, you are uh, the uh, volunteer coordinator. And um, I'm, I'm interested, first of all, tell us a little bit of your history of being a part of uh, Mercy House. So I had seen the, the position um, advertising was looking to, to um, change jobs. And I thought, that's got my name all over. And of course, the job that Father Clarence and his team did, I mean, everyone knew, you know, that Mercy House was here and was coming. So it was pretty neat to to read about it and see it um, come to fruition. So I did none of the traditional, I did all, like none of the electronic online interview, any of that. I brought my portfolio over, met Linda, and then was offered an interview, and then long story short, offered the, the position. And as I've said to Linda, and as I've gone out into the community to speak, that it is not, I do not consider it a job, I consider it a calling, and um, just fortunate to be here. Many people, um, close friends included, when I accepted the position, they thought, isn't that going to be depressing? depressing. Yeah. Exactly, Jeff. And I was just like, based on my Christian faith, my upbringing, it's, um, many of our volunteers will say it's a gift to be here, whether in their ki kitchen providing food for the family or whether they're at the bedside holding the hand of someone they only know because of Mercy House as they take their final breath. And, and that is a gift. And so to be able to witness that and be a part of it and, and um, support you know the volunteers and the staff is really great place to come to work every day. Right, right. Yeah. So as the director of volunteers, uh, you, I understand that you have lots of volunteers. We do. Um, when someone does volunteer, uh, and what kind of training does a person get for this? I, I think it's kind of heavy lifting, uh, I would think. <laughs> that, that, yes. I mean, and by that I mean very, very deep, very thoughtful, very uh, uh, important. Exactly, yeah. We, um, I think that I know that the volunteers that we have are called to be here, with reg regardless of what their um, faith beliefs are, their spiritual beliefs, their non beliefs. I just feel that there's a draw f for the group of volunteers that we have here. So the volunteer orientation that we do is. Um, it's interesting that you say because it's really not heavy lifting. Like I think the heavy lifting happens once they go through the orientation and then are assigned, you know, the, the volunteer position that they want to do, yeah. and that's when they follow in the footsteps of a current 
volunteer. So if we have a companion who um, has been with us a while, we assign a new companion to them. And that's where you, that's where the training happens to see how they're going to fit in, you know, by the bedside of someone who's, you know, actively passing. Mm -hmm. Our caregivers, a lot of our caregivers do have health care background. A lot of retired nurses, that is not a prerequisite, but they um, provide a great service to us. And not only their knowledge, but their ease at the bedside, but then also helping those that want to volunteer here but have no medical background, but come and find it um, such a blessing to be here. Right. When a person volunteers, uh, how many hours would they ordinarily spend? Uh, and are they always with the same person in the same room day by Good day? Good question. The, we don't have a, there's shifts that we have, and now a lot of that's gone out the window because of COVID, but our kitchen shifts are pretty much set shifts based on the meal times. Um, we have receptionist shifts that, are, that cover at the information desk or the receptionist desk because of the fact that we're a secure facility, we want to know who's coming and going. And they, the, those volunteers have done a great job keeping track of who's coming and going because there were a lot of changes with COVID as to how many people could be in the building. Um, caregivers and co companion shifts are usually um, a four-hour shift. We're taking a look at that, though, um, just because of some of the changes that you know we're realizing because of COVID and where we go you know, in the future to keep everyone safe. Right. Um, it's interesting that you ask about, you know, are, are they assigned the same person? To me, that's one of the beauties of our volunteer program. If we have a, if we have a resident who is agitated, um, actively passing, and there's no family member with them, we will assign a person to that resident so they're not alone. But however, we have, there might be seven other residents who are here, and so the volunteers can kind of come and go into the different rooms and visit with the residents so they're not alone. Yeah. Yeah. Linda, I'm looking at the, the mission statement for Mercy House. Uh, Mercy, Mercy House will provide a home with an extended family for people with terminal illness so they can live the final chapter of their journey with dignity and experience the unconditional love of God. It means that almost uh, no one wants to die alone. The fact that you are in a community of, of faith surrounded by people who are here beca only because they, they want to offer their comfort and support, um, that's, that's a powerful thing. It is, and we are grateful to be here to care for those most in need, the terminally ill. Um, 10 bed facility, we've cared for 635 mm -hmm. residents over the past five years. And the between the volunteers and the staff, that's our mission, that they are taking care of 24 seven, whatever they need, along with their families as well, yeah. you know? And we do not want anyone to be alone. So we are there. Um, there's a lot of support between um, hospice nurses, uh, we have part-time social worker, um, and then of course our administrative group. Mm -hmm. So being a, a 10 bed home, we have that opportunity to visit and be with our residents. Let's talk about how someone is admitted into the Ministry of Mercy House. Sure. So uh, anyone who has a terminal diagnosis, uh, they or their family members can call here directly. Uh, they do need a hospice referral, so we do ask that they call hospice as well. And then they coordinate with our Director of Resident Care, Amy Roma, and we go out and meet the families and the residents, whether they're at the home or a nursing home or hospital, to make sure that they are appropriate for Mercy House. And then based upon bed availability, we bring them here. Right. Yeah. And they don't. Uh, they don't. Um, uh, insurance doesn't cover this. Um, uh, the, this Mercy House is supported by donations and contributions. Right. And not by um, 
government um, subsidies or, right. or even someone's insurance. Right, right. So we do accept long-term insurance, um, but that's few and far between. You know, that seems to be an insurance of the past. So uh, we've had maybe a handful over the past five years of long-term mm -hmm. care insurance. Um, but no, we are donation-based. So one of the things that I do uh, is write for grants. And we've been blessed to be funded by grants, and then of course our community, and then the different fundraisers that we host, or even better, uh, local community groups host for us. Yeah. So right. it takes a village, um, and it just takes all that support to make this work, and uh, it's working. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, which of you would like to talk about, there's a fundraiser coming up in the fall. Is that right? Okay. Really? So we'll <laughs> well, I'm you happy that? to. Well, I'm happy to pitch it. Dan's yeah, a big part of it, yeah. Okay. Well, 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 yes. Yeah. So, we, we, Mercy House hosts two annual fundraisers. So, it, this past June, uh, every June, we have a golf tournament. Very successful this year. It's always at Enjoy. It's a lot of fun. Moving forward, the last Thursday in October of every year, we have a Gala of Taste. So we're coming up on our eighth Gala of Taste. And it's a lot of fun. It used to be in-person event where we would have 500 guests join us and auctions, wine tasting, music, entertainment, um, food, raffles, fun, fun, fun. COVID hit, so last year we uh, took a leap of faith and we tried it virtually. Lo and behold, that was a success. Wow. And we had a lot of fun with that. And Anne is a big part of the gala. She really, really is. So, And we have a volunteer group that helps as well. So uh, starting in August, we'll get the planning rolling for that. This year we hope to do a hybrid, so a, a little bit in person, and then we'll still do the virtual yeah. event. Yeah. So it's a lot of fun, yeah. As a person who likes to eat, uh, I'm interested in the taste part. Uh, we're not talking about taste in terms of culture, we're talking about food. Mm. Yes, yes. In the past we've had to do, we had, there were different restaurants that would kind of highlight their specialty, and then that would be paired with with wines and then we'd have desserts and coffee bar as well. A um, little different with a hybrid event, but PS Restaurant has been a tremendous um, supporter of Mercy House and you can't go wrong with their food. <laughs> so, so we hope to partner with them again and then we'll add again the um the virtual online auction which was just really fun that's amazing and right? it was interesting too that because like there were you know we think we think that everyone knows about mercy house but there were people that had no idea of what we do and had tuned in because they had heard about it and now have become you know friends of mercy house which yeah. is great wonderful mm -hmm. wonderful yeah that's one of the things that happens when you do a fundraiser is that uh, people who are just of the goodness of their heart contributing financially or in terms in kind, but then they find out a little bit more about what they're contributing to, right. and that leads to uh, getting the word around. Yeah. And as you know, uh, mm -hmm. when people begin to talk about your your work, uh, that's the best advertising you can get. Exactly. Yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. It even beats a TV program. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take, can we take kind of a, a, a quick description of the place, the sense of place, and I don't, which of you would like to do that? So being in a building that was purposed to be a, a church, sanctuary, some meeting rooms, and some educational space, um, give us a tour as we come in the front door, what would a family expect to find? When you walk into our front doors of our house, you feel right away the calming presence of peace. And we hear that a lot. So when you walk in, people say, oh, Mercy House, oh, okay, we'll, we'll go for a tour, we'll check it out. And they walk in and it, they're just amazed, like, oh, it's so peaceful, and there's music or it's quiet. And then as they tour through uh, the 10 resident rooms, we have a nursing station, we have our chapel, the kitchen, a common area, and then a beautiful waterfall 
So it's just very uh, serene, almost zen. So you feel that peace and that spirituality when you're here at Mercy House. And there are 10 rooms, ten, yes. ten rooms. Um, and you have a common area, which ordinarily, when we're not in a pandemic, right. is a place for families to gather yes. um, uh, comfortably, easy chairs, um, that water feature. Uh, Puts them to sleep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We may have to stop there on the way home. <laughs> and then the kitchen. Um, the kitchen provides meals for, for families uh, as they're with, with their loved one. So that was a big part, and that was um, how we evolved. You know, when we first opened, we thought, oh, okay, definitely we're going to feed the residents, okay. But then the families were here, too, for hours on end, so we thought, oh, we have to, you know, Father Clarence is all about the food and hospitality and, and the, the smells of the food throughout yeah. the home, right? So uh, he said, we're feeding everybody. So that's what we did pre-pandemic. There would be um, hot food, cold food, snacks, chocolate. Oh my gosh, everywhere. <laughs> so the families would come in. We have a large TV as well. So if some sporting event or some news conference was on, people would come out or just to take a break from the mm -hmm. loved one's room. And they would meet other family members that are going through the same thing. I was wondering about yeah. that. The, yeah. the there are 10 rooms, and if you have six or seven people here mm -hmm. uh, in their last days, weeks, right. Um, right. Um, that the other families gather together and they do have a, a very deep emotional bond just automatically. Yes, and sometimes that carries further. So after their loved one has passed, you know, we receive calls or we'll see somebody right out in the community. I had a couple calls. Uh, Hey, Linda, can I get the cell number of so-and-so? Their wife was in room four, yeah, you know, and yeah. they, they want that information so they can continue that friendship, right. you know, that they had made while they were here. Right. So, yeah. Yep. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, our guests today on the Encounter Program are uh, Anne Luanico, who is the volunteer coordinator for Mercy House, and the executive director, Linda Serra. And we're talking about the ministry of Mercy House as a place of grace and comfort, um, warm, caring support, uh, and supported by the community financially. I noticed on the patio out front, first of all, you're at uh, 212 North McKinley Avenue, so it's a pretty busy road, but it's very quiet inside here. The patio, I noticed, has uh, paving stones with people's Names, that's a fundraiser? Still going on? It is, yeah. $50 gift to Mercy House. And it's interesting because it's not only those who have passed on. People have chosen to um, gift that, you know, to someone. I mean, who needs another mm -hmm. souvenir or tchotchke or if you have it? Right. So they make right. a donation to us and put a, fr a friendly, you know, greeting. Um, space is limited on the on the um, paver, but right. we make it work. And right. it's interesting to see the um, how such a simple gesture can mean so much. We recently we've had families in town and have wanted to come because they want to show the pavers. Right. Yeah. So yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was I was touched by the room where the rose and the person's name are on the pillow and a quilt and and so the room is is in memorial for a, a short time after the person has passed yes uh, we do that with each resident that passes uh, we place a rose and then our mercy house prayer on the pillow um, in remembrance of them and we do that for at least 24 hours sometimes the family likes to come back the next day uh, perhaps they didn't pick up all of their belongings so um, it's just helpful to have that peace and some closure there and and respect that's what it's all about and and these are our our homemade donated quilts yes yes the uh there are what three Three different groups mm -hmm. that in our area that donate quilts, wow. Afghans, um, 
They're beautiful. We yeah. have a very nice collection. Um, if the family would like to take the quilt home after their loved one has passed, they may do so. Um, or, you know, of course they can leave it here, but um, that's just something else that we offer for them right. to help right. with that memory and, yeah. you know, because when they're here, they're allowed to be just family members. That's what it's all about. They don't have to worry about medications, entertaining, cooking, cleaning, right? We right. do all of that. Right. So that just helps them make those um, memories for their loved ones as they transition out. Yeah. We have a tremendous, tremendous core of volunteers who are anxious to get back. Yeah. And we are waiting for that day too, but understand that we need to be cautious. And the, the volunteers um, know that. I mean, you know, their demographic, you know, we've had volunteers whose children have forbid them to go anywhere. <laughs> it's like the kids are taking care of the adults. Sure. And it's just, it's a, it's a different time for all of us. Um, we have had receptionist volunteers here. We've had some, we've had to be creative. Um, we've had some volunteers do some administrative stuff behind the scenes. And what I think is really neat, Linda spoke to the whole food and nourishment part. Um, everyone loves baked goods. So we have a core of volunteers who bake and bake delicious desserts, brownies, you name it, and will secretly, they don't secretly drop it off, but we know they're coming. Well, um, God's blessing on your work. And um, I say work, um, it's, it's ministry, it's, it's uh, support, comfort, it's grace enabled through caring people. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Anne Lamonico is the uh, volunteer coordinator. That doesn't mean that you're volunteering to be a coordinator. You're coordinating the volunteers. That's correct. <laughs> and then Linda Sarah is the um, executive director of Mercy House. Uh, I'm Jeff Kellum, the parish associate at the Union Presbyterian Church in Endicott. Thank you for being with us and hoping that you'll join us again next week on Encounter. In the meantime, be gentle with people and with yourself.